fried rice and marinara. Yeah. Young Mikey Yam danced to his front door. Mom, do you know I'm about to turn four? All of my friends will come over and play. Then piles of presents will fill our driveway. We'll have a huge cake, mm. and my buddies will say, your party was perfect. Hip, hip, hooray! Mikey's mom smiled as he finished his speech. Your plan is fantastic, my sweet little peach. But no celebration is ever complete until you've decided what you want to eat. Her statement stopped him dead in his tracks. <gasps> Food, of course! Every party needs snacks. Well, pizza is something that everyone loves, but tacos fit in your hand like a glove. Burgers and hot dogs are easy to eat, but pork and fried rice is such a nice treat. He needed a guru, a trusted grub guide. Maybe my grannies can help me decide. What food did you have for your birthday, Babu? In Hong Kong, Chinese food is all that we knew. Huh. Nona, do you know what food you would choose? My roots are Italian, so pasta can't lose. Oh. Chinese or Italian? Both are delicious. He remembered his cousin's birthday dishes. For the twins, rice and spice on their special day. While Joe had lasagna, he ate a whole tray. Yum, 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 yum. Mikey was stuck, not sure what to do. He couldn't decide between the two. Ravioli or dumplings? Linguini or lo mein? All of these options were hurting his brain. Focaccia, burrata, caprese, risotto, dim sum or wontons or noodles and shrimp roe. His mind was a jumble of possible choices. He heard both sides of his family's voices. <sighs> he rushed to the park to get out of his head. His best friend, Sophia, found him and said, Are you okay, Mikey? Why so much sorrow? I can't pick a dish, and my party's tomorrow. Your mom is Italian, your dad is Chinese. You're free to choose food as unique as you please. Why not have both? Is that too outrageous? A Chinese-Italian mashup for the ages. <gasps> yeah! Sophia, that's it. I don't have to choose one. <gasps> he bolted straight home. There was lots to get done. Mikey burst in the kitchen. I'm ready to pick. I've made my decision. This isn't a trick. I want fried rice and marinara sauce. That'll be different, but hey, you're the boss. <gasps> he awoke the next day in a jittery mood. Friends were arriving. Will they like the food? Mikey's mom fried up a wok full of rice. In went the veggies, two eggs, and some spice. 
His friends helped give the tomatoes a squish. They drizzled the sauce mm -hmm. to complete the new dish. Mikey tensed up as his friends took a taste. But the fusion of flavors lit up every face. Despite any doubts, the meal couldn't be beat. The fried rice was savory, the marinara sweet. It tasted more scrumptious than they thought it could. The whole party shouted out, Different is good! getting ready for a big holiday. It's called Chinese New Year. Dad says it is China's most important holiday. Some people celebrate it in the United States too, like me. Whew, we sure are busy right now. We're cleaning last year's bad luck out of our house. Then we're going to buy new red clothes. Dad says red is for good luck. People in China have celebrated Chinese New Year for thousands of years. In that country, People call it Spring Festival. Lunar New Year is another name for the holiday. Chapter 2. A Late Night. We've worked hard to get ready. Now it's the night before Chinese New Year. Even kids get to stay up really late tonight. Last year, I fell asleep too early. This year, I want to stay awake for all the fun. The date for Chinese New Year changes every year. It's based on an old Chinese calendar. It always starts at a time of month when we cannot see the moon from Earth. The holiday always takes place in January or February. We're at my grandparents' house for this big night. There are uncles, aunts, and cousins everywhere. We talk and play games. <laughs> All of this laughing helps me keep my eyes open. <laughs> Family is the most important part of Chinese New Year. Some families also honor the gods and their ancestors. Ancestors are family members from long ago. Some people show honor by praying. Some people put out offerings of food. We have a big feast. There's fish and lots of other food. Then everybody makes dumplings. They're like little cooked pillows with yummy stuff inside. I can't wait 
need to eat them at midnight. Some families make sure to leave some fish for leftovers. They believe they will then have extra food in the new year. Boom! Hop! Firecrackers snap! Fireworks light the sky! It's midnight! Chinese New Year is here, and I'm still awake! People tell different stories about how Chinese New Year started. One story tells of a monster named Nian. Nian showed up at New Year's time. But people learned how to scare Nian away. The monster was afraid of loud noises and the color red. Chapter 3 Still more fun! I finally fall asleep. In the morning, Mom and Dad give me a red envelope. Money falls out when I open it up. Chinese New Year really is a lucky time. Children often receive many red envelopes during Chinese New Year. The envelopes come from grown-up relatives, family friends, or neighbors. Chinese New Year doesn't stop after one day. We keep celebrating! We wear our new clothes. We take presents to friends and family. We try to be very good. This starts the year out right. Chinese New Year used to be 15 days long. Some people no longer celebrate that whole time, but many people still celebrate for several days. Chapter 4 Parade! Chinese New Year ends with a big parade. My favorite part is the dragon. Dad says dragons are lucky too. Many Chinese men moved to California in the mid-1800s. They brought the Chinese New Year celebration to California. In modern times, the city of San Francisco has a big Chinese New Year parade each year. The parade's dragon is over 200 feet, 60 meters long. I guess Chinese New Year is finally over. But I have enough luck to last until next year. Popo's Lucky Chinese New Year. People spend 15 days preparing and then 15 days celebrating Chinese New Year. Chinese New Year is like Thanksgiving, Christmas, and New Year's Day all bundled together. Popo came all the way from China to celebrate with us in America. She says Chinese New Year is a time for new beginnings. Making sure we have a lucky New Year is serious business. Popo is here to help me. Do not carry dirt out the front door because that means a family member will leave. Swish, swish. 
Popo says I need to sweep out the bad luck before the new year comes. I sweep the dirt toward the middle. I carry it out the back door. I also sweep out my crying baby brother. Popo says I'm naughty. So I sweep him back in and rub his big Buddha belly. Spray, spray. I make sure my window is super clean. Popo says the windows need to be spotless. Good fortune needs to flow in. I'll finish tomorrow. Popo says, you can't clean on New Year's Day. You'd wipe out good luck. Popo has a lot of funny rules about luck. I want to be lucky, but following her do's and don'ts is hard work. Do open the windows and doors at midnight to allow the old year to live. Drip, drop, Popo gets my bath ready. She reminds me to wash my hair. I'll wash it tomorrow. Popo says, your good luck will wash down the drain along with the soapy water. I want good luck. I wash my hair three times. Popo tells me to finish washing my baby brother's hair, but I only wash him one time. I also don't use as much shampoo for him. I'm older, so I need more luck. Do not wash your hair on New Year's Day. Sizzle, sizzle. Popo makes a whole chicken so that our family will stay together. She prepares a fish with the head and tail still on, so we'll have a good beginning and a good ending. It'll also help make our wishes come true. I cross my fingers. This adds extra American luck. Do cook and eat lucky foods. The last dish Popo makes is noodles. I want to break my noodles in half. Popo says noodles should be long and unbroken, like life. I eat two bowlfuls of my long noodles. I eat my baby brother's noodles too. I want to live forever. <laughs> Do hang red and gold banners and paper cuts to ensure a flow of good luck and to invite in good spirits. Snip, snip. Red paper and gold ribbons surround me. I'm busy making and pasting Chinese paper cuts. Popo bought a special sign from Chinatown that says, Fu. It's the Chinese word for luck. She puts this on her door. She says, I'm going to hang this upside down. The Chinese words for upside down sound like arrive. So this means luck has arrived. Do not sleep on New Year's Eve. Your parents will live longer lives. Sip, sip. I drink green tea so I can stay awake past midnight. No sleeping for me. Popo says I have to welcome the new year. The sound of the word sleep in Chinese is like the word for trouble. We don't want any trouble in the new year. I watch Popo and Mama play mahjong with friends. Click, click. The little blocks move quickly. Even my baby brother stays up. It's finally here. It's Chinese New Year's Day. Gong hei fa choi. Happy Chinese New Year. 
I make a ruckus running around the house. Popo says, the first person you meet today and the first words you hear are important to your fortune in the new year. I want to be the first person my baby brother sees today. I whisper in his ear, Fu, and he coos, Fu, back. <laughs> Do not greet people in their bedrooms. It's unlucky. I bring him to the living room where Po Po makes food offerings to our ancestors. On Chinese New Year's Day, Popo says I can't say any bad words or think bad things. I push bad thoughts out of my head, but it's really hard work, especially when my baby brother is around. I do not call him bad names even when he pulls my hair. This is the hardest rule to follow. <clears throat> Do not cut away your good thoughts. Do not use knives or scissors on this day. I wear my new red Changsam. My baby brother wears his new red Changshan. Popo says these are traditional Chinese clothes. She says children should have new clothes and new shoes for the new year. She also says we should wear red. Red will keep bad luck away. It's the color of fire. Popo strings red ribbons in my braids. She puts a red Chinese hat on my baby brother. I wear his hat when Popo isn't looking. Do wear red. It scares away bad spirits and monsters. Do not use the number four. In Chinese language, the character for four sounds like the character for death. I fill a small plate with four almond cookies. Popo adds four more. Four is unlucky, but eight is lucky. She counts everything. She adds or subtracts to avoid the number four. My baby brother has four teeth. I draw an extra tooth for him and tape it to his mouth. Popo says evil spirits will make an exception for baby teeth. I tape it to his diaper just in case. Do make loud noises. The firecrackers, dragon dancers, and gong scare away the evil spirits. Pow, pow! I throw tiny firecrackering snaps on our front doorstep to keep out the evil spirits. Pow, pow! At the parade in Chinatown, I help the dragons chase away evil spirits. I throw the loud snaps at their feet. Popo says only big girls can do this. My baby brother has to wait until he's older. I throw extra snaps for him. Do keep the leaves and stems on fruits and give those to married people. It means they will have a long marriage. Doje, doje. Thank you. Popo and I hand out oranges to family and friends. We're giving them happiness and wealth. I eat a couple because I want to be happy and rich. I eat more because I want to be super happy and super rich. Popo tells me to give oranges to Mama and Papa. I use my brand new red marker to write them a card. Popo almost has a heart attack. No red ink. I 
thought red was lucky. Popo says, Writing in red ink means you want that person to go away. I think about writing a card to my baby brother in red ink. He spilled his lunch all over my chong sum. I take it back. No bad thoughts. Cha-ching! My favorite part of Chinese New Year is getting the lysi. These are lucky red envelopes. Popo says Mama and Papa have to give lysi to little children, unmarried family members, and their own parents. Lysi have crisp, brand new dollar bills inside. I'm glad I'm not a grown-up because I don't have to give away any lysi. From all my relatives, I have a mountain of red envelopes. Popo says I have to put them under my pillow so I won't have bad dreams. Do give children to Lysi because Popo says happiness comes in pairs. <sighs> Finally, the house is quiet. A lucky new year is hard work. I put two red envelopes next to my baby brother's head. I whisper to him, you're lucky to have me. Cora loved the kitchen. She loved to drink in the smells of Mama's Filipino dishes. Mm. Cora's older sisters and brother often helped with the cooking. They got the grown-up jobs, like shredding the chicken or mixing noodles in the pot. They sliced vegetables and rolled lumpia into tiny egg roll shapes. Cora was stuck with kid jobs, like drawing pictures in the flower or licking spoons. She longed to be a real cook. One day, Cora's three older sisters headed to the mall. Her brother darted outside with his ball glove. Now was her chance. Cora popped her head around the corner. Hmm? What are we making today, Mama? Mama wiped her hands on the front of her red apron. She put her hands on her hips. What would you like to make today? Asked Mama in her buttery voice. Cora was surprised Mama was letting her decide. She scrunched up her pug nose and began to think. All her favorite Filipino foods danced in her head. <laughs> Lines of lumpia pranced in rows. Adobo chicken legs bebopped in time. <laughs> she saw a large bowl of pancit. The thick noodles and vegetables curled and swirled in a dance party. Mmm! Will you teach me to make pancit? She asked. <laughs> of course, said Mama. 
Would you like to wear my red apron? Ah! Cora was a real cook now. The apron was a little too big, but it would do. Mama helped Cora tie the strings around her back and make a neat bow at her belly button. This apron belonged to Lolo, your grandpa, said Mama. He wore it when he first came to California. He was a cook for the Filipino farm workers who picked strawberries and grapes in the fields. Did Lolo teach you how to cook? Cora wanted to know. He did, said Mama. I followed him each day to the big kitchen. He created all kinds of dishes to fill the hungry workers' tummies. While he cooked, he told stories about the Philippines where he was born. Cora nodded as she listened. Lolo told us about the countryside where he grew up. His family harvested pineapples, bananas, and papayas. He used to eat smashed fried bananas and sweet rice wrapped in banana leaves. Cora stuffed her hands in the deep apron pockets. She imagined Mama and Lolo cooking together. She saw Lolo as a boy, unwrapping the banana leaves and scooping the sweet rice from inside. Cora knew the rules in Mama's kitchen. She scrubbed her hands with soap. <laughs> Mama dug in the cupboards and refrigerator for ingredients. She listed what they needed for the pancit. Chicken, celery, carrots, mushrooms, onions, baby corn, cabbage, ginger, garlic, soy sauce. Don't forget the noodles! said Cora. Oh yes, the noodles, said Mama. Let's get started, Mama told Cora. Open the package of rice noodles and put them in this bowl of water. <laughs> Do you know why we soak them? So they get soft, answered Cora. You've been paying attention, said Mama with a wink. Cora opened the package. She plopped the big clump of noodles into the bowl. Meanwhile, Mama took out some chicken she had cooked earlier. This was Mama's special stash. She used chicken for all kinds of Filipino dishes like tanghon, chicken curry, and lumpia. Want to help me shred? Asked Mama. Cora's eyes grew wide. A grown-up job! <sighs> she was ready. She pulled the chicken pieces apart the way her older sister Prim did. She placed them on a plate. Cora snuck a tiny bite of chicken. She rolled it to the back of her mouth before Mama noticed. Um, mm. The salty taste tickled her tongue. <laughs> I'll chop, said Mama. Cora arranged the vegetables in neat rows. Mama chopped celery stalks, carrots, cabbage, and onions. When Mama started slicing onions... Tears ran down Cora's cheeks. She looked up and saw Mama's watery eyes. Onions make us cry, sang Mama. <laughs> they both laughed. 
<laughs> Mama took out her huge pancit pan with a shiny copper outside and big handles. The pan was deep enough to hold all the ingredients. Cora danced on her tiptoes to see inside. <sighs> Mama asked Cora to step back while she added some oil and the vegetables to the pan. The pot began to hiss and sizzle. Mama added spices too. Garlic, ginger, and a splash of soy sauce. Mmm! Cora loved the smell of garlic. Can you check the noodles, Cora? Asked Mama. Cora scratched her head. She tried to remember what her sister Sarah did when she checked the noodles. Cora thought she should sniff the noodles. <coughs> But she picked up the bowl too quickly. <laughs> Water sloshed onto the floor. Are you making a mess? Asked Mama with pointy eyebrows. <laughs> Silly Cora, you just need to touch the noodles with two fingers to see if they are soft. Mama laughed and handed Cora a towel to mop up the mess. <sighs> Mama went to work straining the noodles. Now for the fun part, said Mama. Let's add the noodles to the pancit pan. Can I stir? asked Cora. She knew this was another grown-up job. Yes, but be careful near the burner, called Mama, who pulled out a stool for Cora to stand on. Cora began to stir in a wide circle. She watched the noodles somersault over the carrots and celery. She made the soft onions sway this way and that. The smell of ginger mixing with garlic floated to her nose. A few mushrooms escaped from the pot. Oops! That night, Mama brought the food to the table. She set out a platter of adobo chicken two plates of her special lumpia with dipping sauce, and a bowl of pineapple slices. Cora's brother and sisters came to the table one by one. Daddy sat in his usual spot at the head of the table. Cora watched his eyes grow wide as he checked out all the food. He licked his lips. Finally, Mama set the steaming platter of pancit in the middle of the table. You made pancit without us, hollered Cora's brother Crispin. Who did my job? asked Prim. Who checked the noodles? Sarah needed to know. Mama replied, Cora did all the grown-up jobs. Really? said Daddy. That's my girl. Cora scrunched together her eyebrows and bit her lip while the family tasted her pancit. Uh, mm, uh. Did she do everything right? Would they like it? Would Mama tell about the accident with the noodles? Pretty impressive, smiled Cora's sister Irene. Crispin chomped on a big spoonful of pancit and elbowed Cora. Not too bad, Crispin said. Cora grinned. Her eyes sparkled with delight. Daddy sat back in his chair. This tastes like your Lolo's pancit, he said. 
Cora beamed with pride. <laughs> Salamat! She cried out. Thank you. The family laughed. <laughs> Cora was still wearing Mama's red apron. <laughs> <laughs> what your household looks like on most days. <gasps> this is what it will look like the day the internet stops working. Oh. <laughs> What's wrong with the Wi-Fi? Mommy will howl. It's down! Daddy will bellow. Good riddance! Nana will smirk. <laughs> it will be kind of funny, I tell you. You, on the other hand, will be brimming with ideas and plans for things to do. <laughs> Whee! Which will be of no use. But the Wi-Fi! They will whine. is when you will lose it. You will flare your nostrils, fling your hair, and say what you must. Mommy! Daddy! Behave! It is not the end of the world. The internet wasn't even around when you were my age. blink for a million gazillion seconds. <sighs> but that was then. They will finally whimper. <sighs> <sighs> Clearly, you will have to take charge. Do you see the big, wide world out there, waiting to be explored? You will ask. Silence. <laughs> you will dig in your heels, flex your muscles, and stand firm. And fret. <sighs> and protest. But you will knit your brows, roll your eyes, and not give in. <laughs> because
because you know what's good for them. <laughs> what fun it will be! <laughs> One last time, please. They will bleed as you make your way back home. will still be down. But now, they will have other things to think about. <laughs> like the clouds, and the breeze, and the trees. Go to your room, tired and happy. Hmm? Then you will turn on your computer and freeze! Ah! ah! My book report! You'll scream into the quiet night. demand from no one in particular. <laughs> Ask me. I should know. for Dadaji. Mm. Anil was glad his grandparents had come to stay. Dadaji was teaching him to stand on his head and to sit like a serene lotus. Dadima's prayer song made him bob his head from side to side, and the sweet curling smoke from her incense stick tickled his nose so. But his grandparents' stories were the best of all. Anil loved hearing about the faraway village with the green wheat fields and the swaying coconut palms. Who's telling me a story? asked Anil one day. No one answered. Sweet smoke snaked into his nose and the tinkle of a tiny bell murmured in his ear. Dadima's eyes were closed. Hari Om, Hari Om, she chanted. Anil turned to Dadaji, who was standing on his head. Will you tell me a story, Dadaji? Anil asked. Haji, yes sir, one minute, said upside down Dadaji. Then he flipped over, landing with a soft thup, and became a serene lotus on the rug. Anil hopped on his grandfather's lotus lap, and Dadaji began. In a village far, far away, where the warm breeze made the green wheat fields dance and the brown coconuts rustled, lived a lad who astonished the villagers morning, noon, and night. Anil winked at Dadaji. After all, the lad in the story was none other than his very own Dadaji long, long ago. Dadaji went on. In 
the morning, the lad wrestled a snorting water buffalo, and the villagers cried, Are va? Oh, wow! <laughs> At noon, he tied two hissing cobras in a knot. Va! to the villagers. At night, the mighty lad spun three trumpeting elephants by their tails. Va! Va! shouted the villagers. What made the lad so strong? It was the hot, hot roti that sizzled and whistled on Padima's wood hearth. You see, Baba, Padima made the best roti around. Hungry villagers trampled tall fields and swam angry rivers to sniff the fluffy, puffy roti that bubbled and wobbled in ghee on the hot, hot tava pan. Each day, the lucky lad smacked his lips and rubbed his belly and ate a stack so high with a bit of tongue-burning mango pickle. He wanted the power of the tiger, Baba. Oh. After the lad had gobbled up the last roti, he licked salty specks from his fingertips one by one and burped twice. <laughs> Then the power came rolling in like a great flood. Arriba! Haji! Yes, sir, said the mighty lad. And off he went to do more wonderful things. He made the earth rumble beneath him in the morning. <laughs> He shook oh. the giant mango tree for Balima's pickled pot at noon. Uh. <laughs> and he touched the blue, blue sky with his bare feet at night. Areva! <laughs> the villagers roared. Dadaji looked at Anil and rubbed his belly. A rumble grew into a mighty roar. He smacked his lips. Does the lad still have the power, Dadaji? Anil asked. There's only one way to find out, Baba, said his grandfather. Does he want roti today? Anil asked. Anji, hot, hot roti. Dadaji said, his mouth beginning to water. With salty grains to lick, said Anil. And a bit of tongue-burning mango pickle, Dadaji said, drooling a little. Anil ran to ask his mother to make roti, but she was on the phone with Auntie Vinu. So Anil tugged at the edge of Dadima's sari. No roti today, she said with her eyes in, shoot him away. Next, Anil tried his dad, who only ruffled the newspaper and dug his nose deeper into the pages. Finally, Anil tried his big sister, Kiran, but she didn't want sticky globs of dough getting under her starry nails. Don't worry, Dadaji, said Anil. I watch mom make roti all the time. I'll help you get your power back. Anil opened the kitchen cupboard. He pushed past the rice and the red lentils. He pushed past the spices and the green lentils. Watch out, cried mom. Anil found the flour and dumped some into a big bowl. Anil found the salt and dumped that in too. Ay, hi, oh dear, exclaimed Dadima. So much. But Dadaji loved salt. Next, Anil added the water. Shh, cried mom. So much. Kiran laughed at the watery mess, but Anil didn't care. 
He just dumped in more flour. Achoo! Kiran sneezed in a flowery cloud. Are va! The boy has talent! cried Dadaji. Anil mixed the flour and water and added more salt and began to knead the dough. He punched! And he pushed! And he pulled! Are va! Exactly like Badima! shouted Dadaji. When the dough was smooth, Anil rolled it into balls, enough for a roti stack as high as the ceiling. Then Anil grabbed a rolling pin and one of the balls. The dough stuck here and it stuck there, but Anil didn't give up. He rolled north and he rolled south. He rolled east and he rolled west. Haji! Oh, cheered Dadaji. Here it goes! Bit by little bit, the first roti began to form. <laughs> it looks like the USA! Kiran said and laughed. Roti can be any shape, right, Baba? Dadaji said, winking at Anil. Anil rolled out more and more balls of roti dough. Deko, look! Roti number 10 is a perfect circle, remarked Dadima. Aji, practice makes perfect, said Dadaji. When it was time to cook the roti, Dadima got the tava pan, smoky hot, and added some butter. The first roti hissed. Very carefully, Dadima helped Anil flip it. The roti danced and sputtered some more, all brown and buttery. Did Badima make them like this? Anil asked. Haji, Dadaji said, nodding. At last, all the roti were ready. Anil piled them up in a high, high stack. Hot, hot roti for Dadaji! He announced in his biggest voice. Va, va! exclaimed Dadaji. He grabbed a warm, steamy roti from the stack and took one bite, and another, and another. He chomped and he chewed. Mmm, mmm, Dadaji said, smacking his lips. Slurp, slurp, slurp. He licked salty specks from his fingertips one by one. Do you feel the power, Dadaji? Anil asked. Anji, Dadaji said, flexing his muscles. Find me a snorting water buffalo to wrestle. Anil giggled. There are no water buffalo here. Two hissing crowbars to tie in a knot? Dadaji asked. Dadaji, Anil laughed. <laughs> well, surely those are three elephants I hear trumpeting in the backyard, Dadaji said as he gobbled up another roti and licked the salt from his fingertips. Anything is possible, Baba. Let's see what we can do. Hand in hand, Anil and Dadaji went outside to find new adventures. First, they made the earth rumble under their feet. Then, they shook a mighty apple tree for Dadima's pie. Higher, Dadaji, higher! Last, they made their bare feet touch the blue, blue sky.
came back. Emil cried. Dadaji smiled. Haji, he said. The power of the hot, hot roti came back to the lad from a village far, far away. Thank you, my tiger. Thank you. Courageous people who changed the world. William Wilberforce. It is inconceivable that we could be bored in a world with so much wrong to tackle. Little William saw people from Africa being taken as slaves. He knew he had to do something. William told everyone who would listen how bad the slave ships were. In 1807, the leaders of Great Britain finally agreed that the slave trade should end. Harriet Tubman. You have within you the strength, the patience, and the passion to change the world. Little Harriet did not like being told what to do. But because she had dark skin, that's exactly what happened all day long. In 1849, Harriet ran north to freedom. She helped others escape too. People called her secret path the Underground Railroad. Abraham Lincoln. Be sure you put your feet in the right place. Then stand firm. Little Abe saw many people working as slaves in America. No one could agree whether that was good or bad. Abe became president. In 1863, he signed a paper that said all the slaves would be free. Many people were angry, but Abe knew it was the right thing to do. Susan B. Anthony. Failure is impossible. Little Susan wanted to vote for her leaders like the boys could, but that was illegal for girls. Susan tried to vote once, but she got arrested. Susan spent her whole life telling people that everyone should be treated equally. Finally, word spread that things had to change. In 1920, women in America gained the right to vote. Mahatma Gandhi. You must be the change you wish to see in the world. Little Gandhi liked working things out peacefully. When Great Britain tried to make his people pay for salt, Gandhi didn't fight. Instead, in 1930, he walked 241 miles to the coast to get his own salt. 
Gandhi's peaceful march helped thousands of people realize that India should be its own country and that you don't have to fight to make a difference. Rosa Parks I believe we are here on the planet Earth to live, grow up, and do what we can to make this world a better place. Little Rosa noticed that the children with white skin got to ride the bus to school. Children with dark skin had to walk to an older building. In 1955, a city bus driver told Rosa to give her seat to a man with light skin. Nope, Rosa said. She went to jail. Many people stopped riding the bus. After 381 days, the leaders decided to change the rules. Martin Luther King Jr. The time is always right to do what is right. Little Martin went shoe shopping with his dad. The owner said, we only serve people with dark skin in the back. They left the store instead. One day, Martin gave a speech about how we should treat each other. I have a dream, he said. He wanted everyone to be judged by their hearts, not by the color of their skin. In 1964, American leaders finally agreed that Martin was right. Malala Yousafzai. One child, one teacher, one book, one pen can change the world. Little Malala loved to learn. But in Pakistan where she lived, some people said girls shouldn't go to school. Some people tried to stop her. Brave Malala didn't back down. She insisted that every child should go to school. In 2014, when she was 17, Malala became the youngest person to receive the Nobel Peace Prize. These heroes stood up to make a difference in the world. What kind of hero will you be? <laughs> Little heroes, inventors who change the world. Loon. Little Kai liked watching wasps make their delicate nests from strips of bamboo. In AD 105, Kai gathered tiny pieces of bark, old rags, and fishing nets. He mixed them together, pressed the mixture flat, and dipped it in water. 
When the sheet dried, presto, Kai had invented the first piece of paper. Johannes Gutenberg. Like a new star, it shall scatter the darkness of ignorance and cause a light heretofore unknown to shine amongst men. Little Johannes lived at a time when hardly anyone had books because it took too long to write out copies by hand. Around 1439, Johannes sent metal letters down in a block. Adding ink and paper, Johannes created the first printing press. He could print thousands of pages in no time. Ideas started spreading around the globe. Leonardo da Vinci Learning never exhausts the mind. Little Leonardo was curious about everything. He watched, he measured, he wrote, he wondered. He drew plans for machines that became real hundreds of years later. Like a submarine, bicycle, and helicopter. With his greatest tool, a paintbrush, Leonardo invented ways to paint that made him the most famous artist in the world. Thomas Edison. Our greatest weakness lies in giving up. The most certain way to succeed is always to try just one more time. Little Thomas was always reading and asking questions. One question was, why must I use dirty, smelly gas lamps to light my home at night? He began to tinker with light bulbs. In 1879, after hundreds of failed attempts, he finally found a way to keep one lit. Now people all over the world use electricity to see in the dark. Louis Pasteur. To know how to wonder and question is the first step toward discovery. Little Louis lived when no one really knew why people got sick. Using his microscope, he looked and looked and looked for the answer. Finally, Louis discovered something no one else could see, germs. He found that if you boiled the germs, they went away. In 1885, Louis learned that germs could protect people too. Since then, Louis' vaccines have saved millions of lives. Marie Curie. Nothing in life is to be feared. It is only to be understood. Little Marie loved to study elements, materials that come from the earth. She tested a special rock until she found a strange glowing blue light. What could it be? Marie had discovered a brand new element, radium. Doctors soon found that radium could fight off deadly cancers. In 1903, Marie was the first woman to ever win a Nobel Prize.
The Wright Brothers. Isn't it astonishing that all these secrets have been preserved for so many years just so we could discover them? Little Wilbur and Orville were brothers who liked to tinker with machines. One day, their father brought home a toy helicopter that flew. They wanted to fly too. They studied the wings, the tail, and everything they needed to know about flight. Crashing never discouraged them for long. Finally, in 1903, they flew the first airplane. Grace Murray Hopper. If you've got a good idea and you know it's going to work, go ahead and do it. Little Grace loved learning about math, science, and cool gadgets. Once, she took apart seven alarm clocks just to see how the gears worked. When she got older, Grace figured out how to program a room-sized computer to respond to human language, not just number codes. Now people all over the world can use computers every day. These heroes imagined and invented a better world. What kind of hero will you be? don't have books, what are you waiting for? It's a kid-safe, ad-free library full of storybooks brought to life. My favorite story on books is the unicorn and horse because the horse feels like he's, well, not beautiful, but he actually is. I'm going to explore more on books and you should too. Don't wait around. Ask your grown-up and start exploring more fun stories like these. You'll be glad you did. Thanks for watching. For more stories, try the Vox app for free today.